rise before the sun. It's that time of year. Load up my gun. Put on my gear. Here we go. I'm pumped to bring on a a guy that that I found through some other friends, and I know is going to bring us some great great insights today. I'm Dr. Brooks Tiller, and this is the Healthy Hunter Show. And today I've got a man who has gone through some hard stuff and he's seen some dark times after struggling with, with years of addiction and he found sobriety and now he helps others find, find the solace that he found through the outdoors. He's an outdoor educator. He's an, he's an encouraging man. He helps to get veterans and others out into the outdoors to help them heal and help the outdoors to heal them the way that it helped to heal him. He's a wild game chef, and you may know him as the flip-flop guy, but he's faced fear, he's overcome <laughs> demons, and he is a better man, and he helps others because of it. It is my pleasure today to welcome Andy Mokel to the show. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, Brooks, I appreciate it a lot, man. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, and my pleasure. Um, you know, in this crazy world we got going on right now, uh, just to start off with something that's going <laughs> good in your world. What's going good in my world right now? Well, <clears throat> we're in the heart of hunting season out here in Western hunting and uh, on, the, on the West Coast. Um, my hunting season has been this year, probably one of my favorite hunting seasons that I've had. Uh, there was a lot of things that were supposed to happen that didn't happen uh, due to COVID and everything like that, which was a serious on um, on one hand I was extremely bummed out about it on the other hand it was a very great opportunity to dive into other aspects and things that I had wanted to check out and and uh, areas that I wanted to explore um, so I mean I killed the biggest buck of my life this year uh, it was a 27 27 and a half inch four by four mule deer we had been on it for uh i don't know two months uh it had a it had a counterpart buck that was running around with it it was a probably a six by six roughly 30 or 32 inch deer um the buck i ended up shooting the four by four he had a seven inch drop time in the beginning of rifle season and by the time that i caught up with him he had broken it off which was a bummer but you know, I'm still not going to complain about the biggest buck I've ever shot. So that was good. That's yeah. been a good highlight yeah. so far. Definitely. And it's, I mean, something like that is the character. It's a story you can tell when it's over with. And that's part of it. You know, if it was, if it was super easy, hey, first day of deer season, I went out and a deer just showed up. My shot is the biggest buck ever. It doesn't, doesn't hold as much weight uh, when you're sitting around the dinner table telling that story to other people as it does a great one that you chase and you finally found out after he's had some battle scars thrown on sure. as as we all have some battle scars and we all relate <laughs> to that you know yeah and the what's funny is earlier in the season during archery in california we're allowed two buck tags so the first buck that walked out in front of me uh it was just a small forked horn and I have my bow he walked out he stopped at 40 yards you know for me that's a no-brainer shot I passed on him and then he ran, you know, I'm talking to the deer out loud, like, go away. I, you know, I don't, I'm not interested in you. And he, and he stopped at 70 yards. And when he stopped at 70 yards broadside and looked back at me, he stood there for a minute and a half. And I was just like, I got to send it, man. Um, you know, and I ended up getting that buck too, which was, which was, which was nice. Nice. Yeah. Sometimes they're just like, Hey, I'm, I'm here for you. Take me. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, and sometimes I kind of just need to stack legs. So. Exactly. And exactly. And, and I think that's one of the things I'd love to dive into a little bit is yeah. how you got involved in the outdoors. And I've heard a little bit of your story about, you know, how, how the outdoors really saved you. And I would love to kind of uh, hear from your, from from the horse's mouth if you will ex exactly what the outdoors did for you and how you've been able to share the outdoors with others to help them 
So uh, the outdoors, um, when it comes to my family, you know, is, is generations, you know, my, my family first came to America in the late 1500s. So, I mean, I, you could say that the outdoors has been my family's life, you know, for centuries. However, so my grandfather, my grandmother on both sides, my, my mother's parents and my father's parents were both into the outdoors. They both loved hunting, um, camping, everything like that, as far back as we can remember. Uh, and I was kind of just born into it, you know, I'm born into a life where, you know, every spring and summer, you know, we're doing wild game feeds, we're going abalone diving, we're camping on the coast, uh, salmon fishing, halibut fishing, sturgeon fishing, everything like that. And so I was extremely fortunate where I was born into it. You know, I have a, a mom and a dad who were both very much into it. So my whole life growing up was all about it. And coming into my teenage years, I kind of fell away from it, you know, around 13, 14. I was way more involved in the social aspect of life and peer pressure and everything like that. So living in Marin County, I, I kind of fell into, you know, smoking pot and, you know, doing, you know, quote, extracurricular activities, drinking and everything like that. Um, and that became an immense part of my life. And uh, by the time that I was 15, I had become a ward of the court system or a ward of the state. Um, the state didn't like anything that I was doing. I'd been kicked out of several high schools and kind of shipped all around the United States going to different inpatient rehab centers and everything like that. Um, the first one being Wilderness Treatment Center. My parents felt like the wilderness was gonna save me. And uh, they sent me to a place called WTC in Montana. I don't even know if it's still in existence to this day, but um, Wilderness Treatment Center, I went there. And the impact that that had on my life and reconnecting me with the outdoors. We did a 16 day cross country skiing trip in the Bob Marshall in Montana, which I think there's a, three or four day solo trip that's involved in that where you basically live in a snow cave for three or four days, you know, and, and you get hot water brought to you once a day. Cause after all, we're just 15 year old kids, 16 year old kids, but, um, and just really try to reconnect with ourselves and look at our life and the things that we've done and, um, compartmentalize and, and learn how to deal with it. Um, after that, uh, I had gone to Texas, Texarkana, Texas, to another live-in facility down there for another 90 days. And when I came out, you know, I had this new found respect for life and uh, sobriety and everything like that. And um, during that time, you know, I'd, I'd managed to stay sober for a while, you know, a few years a number of years and and after a while i kind of felt like you know i got this licked and you know there's there's no big deal here you know i could smoke pot once a while i, I could have a drink once in a while and things like that and come to find out very quickly after i decided to start partaking again um, my life fell apart you know within a matter of three weeks um, my family basically wanted nothing to do with me. Uh, long story short, a year and a half into that, I came to the conclusion that this was not the life for me. Um, you know, I was pretty much living out of my car or on my friend's couch and, uh, you know, defecating blood on a daily basis. That's, you know, to kind of sum up the severity of my drinking problem that I had, uh, you know, morning shakes, you name it, it was, you know, all prevalent. And uh, I kind of came to the, the decision that this was not the life that I wanted. And this is not the life that was going to be best for me. And um, I went back, got sober, cleaned up my life. And 
kind of started checking that out, but being serious about it this time, you know, and, and really exploring and, and understanding the spiritual connection, the spiritual connection to nature, the spiritual connection to God and figuring out, you know, how am I really going to do this? You know, and, and I made that, that decision that I was all in and no matter what, you know, drinking and drugs were not going to be a part of my life anymore. And I was willing to go to any length at that time in order to, you know, conquer those demons. Wow. I mean, that, that speaks volumes right there. Of just, uh, you know, that, that how the outdoors can teach us so much about ourselves. Whenever we're out there, you know, you, you find out a lot about yourself. It's, it's that challenge where, it doesn't matter who you are, what demons you have, or, or what, as a lot of people like to tell, you know, how, um, how, how, how many good things you have going in your life or, or how, how privileged you are, uh, it, when you're out in the woods, like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, nobody cares how much money you have. They don't care. You know, the woods doesn't care yeah. what your status is, what your job is. They don't care anything other than like, can you survive? I mean, it, it's, it's a laugh all the time, like weightlifting and the woods, like it, it, it just wants to kill you. That's it. And that's one of the things I love about it is, you, you, I mean, if you're, if you're squatting or deadlifting something really heavy, like if, if there's a bunch of weight on your back, it just wants to go down and you're in the way of it. And it's the same way when you're in the woods. I think that's one of the things that we really find ourselves. And it's so awesome that you have, I mean, you, you know, you, you realize that and, and I think it's one of those things where you you found that there's things that you can do, things that you don't need to be doing, and and how that the outdoors has really helped you. And now you're you're bringing other people to the outdoors, and it may not be an addiction, but there are things that they are they are facing, and that when they're out there in the outdoors, they can. It's at quiet time, like the Bible talks about. You know that there's that still small voice, and you're out there, and you can hear those things that maybe the the world is just too loud to hear, but now you're out in the woods and you're, maybe you're sitting there on the mountain or you're in a deer stand, wherever, duck blind, you can just hear. And those things that are inside your head, it feel like they just come out. And, and now you're, you're helping other people to find that, which is amazing. Yeah. Well, one thing that I found, uh, and it, and it took me a while to gain my bearings and, and kind of get back on track to my full passion and desire of what I love doing in life, you know, it took a few years um, of sobriety, you know, and learning and relearning who I am as a person and what do I like to do and what are my interests and what are my hobbies, you know, because my interests and hobbies up to that point in my life had only been drugs and alcohol, you know what I mean? Drinking to oblivion, 100%, you know, and the scary thing for someone like me when I drank is like, when I would start drinking, it doesn't matter what my engagements were the next day or that day, all bets were off. You know, there was, there was no stopping. And when I got to reconnect and seriously dive back into hunting and dive back into nature and dive back into the outdoors, you know, that was when I really started to find a real peace of mind you know, and, and, you know, like what you were, what you were referencing, spending all that time outdoors, you know, as hunters, whether you're in a tree stand or you're Western hunting and you're, you know, going ridge to ridge, you know, you, you're by yourself for 12, 16 hours, five days, who knows, 12 days and spending all that time alone, I think is, so important for the soul you know excuse me i tell a lot of people nature is my church you know what i mean and and when i go into the woods i find the same reprieve that extremely religious men find when they go to church on sunday you know and they hear their pastor or their preacher or whoever it may be that they're listening to <clears throat> And you can't, I can't, I, I'll speak with I statements. I can't find another area in my life 
where I can connect that deeply with a power greater than myself and know that I can't, I have, I have zero control when I'm in nature. You know what I mean? I have, there is, there is nothing out there that I control the wind, you know, the rain, none of the trees, the growth of the, the feed, anything, you know, and, and the amount of time to get to spend out there, you know, and have that connection for me is paramount to everyday life and existence and, you know, being a happy, healthy human being and being able to pack as much as I can into life. And upon finding all that out for myself, you know, like I felt like when I, when I started finding all this out, like I felt like, Oh my God, I just found the pot of gold, you know, like, you know, and, and it, people want to talk about PTSD and, you know, all of these different um, mental health issues that we as individuals have, uh, whether it be from, you know, military trauma or just trauma in life growing up, you know, um, finding, finding relief from that for me was, was paramount you know, and, and it was at that point where I was kind of like, I need to share this with as many people that I, as I can, uh, and let people know that everybody can have relief from all of their problems. You know, if they're willing to accept hunting or accept nature and accept the outdoors, you know, as a vessel for something that can offer them that reprieve. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of those things that when we're out there, we realize that. And I know for me, there's a lot of times, you know, my wife, she's like, you, you, do you need to go sit in the woods for a day or two? Like, it, you know, you're, you're a little much to handle. And, you know, for me, it, it, like I'm, I get, you know, I get all, you know, it's one of those things where I think that instead we let the weight of the world just pile up. But whenever you're out there, it, it's kind of a recentering. You're, you're sitting out there, like you said, and it's just you and it's and your thoughts it, and your th and that's the scariest thing in the world like i i don't know how many like, people can't do that oh do what how many people can't do that oh and but and and it's it's not they i don't know if it's they, they can't they just don't want to because i mean how many people you medicate yourself with the phone and with you know i mean some people like I, i've heard it said and i have a few friends who who are in recovery and, and we've gone through some things together where I wanted to learn more about it. And, and it's really interesting that, that we we've applied it in different aspects as in working with them, but everybody's an addict on a scale to something and whether it be, you know, junk food or your work or the cell phone or whatever it may be, like we have these things that we are addicted to and I think whenever you get out there in the woods and there's nothing and it's just you and your thoughts, it's kind of, it's kind of like that. You always sleep with one person and that's you, like you're going to sleep and it's just you, no matter where you're at, you can't get away from you. And we medicate so much of TV and internet, whatever it may be that we want to just get away from the world and put it aside because I, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of times that I, I'm a little scared if somebody got inside my own, my big noggin, what they're going to, what, like, it's a scary place in there. It's like VH1 pop-up videos most of the time, <laughs> you know, like there's so much information in here and there's so much stuff and there's so many ideas. And it's like, what am I doing? And, but when I get out to the woods, it's all of a sudden you take that deep breath and you're like, Hey, like, well, I, I'm all this stuff that needs to be done is not getting done right now. So just sit, enjoy the moment, be where your feet are, as, as my folks like to say, be where your feet are. And, and it's awesome. Like all of a sudden it's like, it's like the, the computer, the old computer, whenever you'd have to like reconfigure everything, get everything put where it needs to be. Cause your files are all crazy. All of a sudden it's like things <laughs> kind of lined up and, you know, and then you walk out of the woods. I feel like a better, a better human, a better man. And, and for me, I know that there's times when I go to the woods, I come back and I'm better for my family and I'm better at work and I'm better just overall. And I'm more productive because I have reconfigured all these crazy things that are in my head. And whether it be 
you know, those, those addictions, I mean, whenever you're in the woods, like you're away from those things and w whatever that addiction might be for us. And I feel like that is the place where we just get recentered and get refocused into who we were actually created to be and finding our purpose. Yeah. 100%. You know, and, and that's how for me, I've, I've kind of felt and been able to find, um, you know, like I was saying, being able to find that recentering and how it's helped me resolve a lot of issues and a lot of things that I've been through. Um, one of the largest, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. <clears throat> one of the largest neglected things that we have, I think, today in our society is the ability and the want and need to help vets and vet veterans, you know, and, and I think maybe our VA is getting better today than it was, you know, six years ago. Um, but what I really found around 2010, I started taking, you know, just individual vets that I knew or I had met out into the woods, out into the field, getting them hunting, giving them a weapons platform that they're familiar with and watching the same ease and comfort that washes over me wash over them, you know, and, and that is, you know, I, I mean, I want to say at a grassroots level, that has been one of the best ways that I've found to be able to help veterans um, untangle that stress of making the transition from, you know, soldier life back into becoming a civilian, yeah. you know, and the importance of that is um, tremendous. Yeah. And I think untangle is the key word right there because you know, we, we, we are so good at fighting we're so good at just being focused and, and whatever it is, if it's work, job, life, we're just focused on getting it done. And, and, and we don't take sometimes that step back to take care of ourself mm -hmm. to, like you said, and I love that untangling that you talk about. I mean, and we talk about health and fitness and we often think about just the physical body. We're like, mm -hmm. Oh, we got to work out. We got to run. We got to do all this. We got to be, you know, six pack abs, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> but you do all that. That's great. You look great, but you're super stressed out. And like you said, like your mind's tangled and everything in your world just gets tangled up and then it comes crashing down. And we often forget that simple mental side. And like you said, it's, you can see it when somebody gets in the woods, you take somebody to the woods for the first time or again, and maybe they hadn't been there in a while and that just untangling just yeah. bam. And it's like, all of a sudden that, like you said, they, they come out of there better and not only for themselves, but for everyone they love and, and for the world in general. So, I mean, I think that for me, I think that, that untangling right there was, was, um, that's, that's key. And I've never thought about it that way, but that's really what it is. When you go to the woods, you become untangled. Yeah, there was a, so I also teach hunter's education. I'm a hunter's education instructor for the state of California. And I got, I got into that um, in memory of my grandfather, right? My grandfather was a hunter's education instructor as well as a California fish and game warden. And <clears throat> I tried to think a lot of what can I do? And, and now we're going back, what is it? Eight years ago now. Um, uh, I tried to think, what can I do to help, you know, pass the torch, carry the tradition, you know, try to enlighten other people what had been given freely to me my entire life, which is the experience of the outdoors. And <clears throat> I got into Hunter's education and a fella came through one of my classes and he's born in India. He came to America, you know, great job, all kinds of stuff. He had never been outside of the desert, whether it was in India or in Southern California where he was working. And uh, 
he agreed he agreed to come out and come on a pig hunt with me and i took him on a pig hunt and now we're in northern california in the middle of the forest and the, in the rainy season right so everything is rich the environment is so green you know that it's just it's so vivid now for me as a hunter and somebody who experiences this you know 200 days a year i take it for granted right and i hate to say it but you know it's just fact it's so commonplace for me that it's you know it's just a byproduct of what i'm doing you know it's lost its lust right me and this fella are out hiking around God, and I can't remember what rifle he was using, but he was using some crazy tactical rifle. And we're hiking around and, and he stops for a second and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, Andy, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And he starts crying and he starts telling me about the divorce he's going through and all these problems in his life that he's going through and how this is exactly what he needed in order to find balance in his life. And this is his first hunting time of it, his first hunting experience and uh, getting to be able to be there and get to get to experience that and, and get to provide that experience for him um, in the moment was life changing for me, you know, to see someone who'd never been out of the desert. They'd never seen forest. They'd never seen, you know, green grass at this level and, you know, everything fresh growth and all of that and uh to just watch him break down and cry and really embrace and take in the moment was uh you know a blessing 100 percent. yeah that i mean that there is powerful i mean just by itself because <clears throat> i mean uh like you said, there's something that we often take for granted and somebody else, it changes their life. Yeah. And that, that's powerful, powerful. Absolutely. You know, and what better way, you know, what better yeah. way? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, you're, you're doing this, you're, you're, you're an outdoor educator, you're teaching people and you're taking people out hunting and, and I'd be amiss if, if one of the ways that I came across you was, like I said, from, uh, old Bert Soren was talking about the flip-flop method of deer. And that's another great way that I found to get people involved in hunting in the outdoors is, you know, I live just south of Nashville and we have friends that live in Nashville. And during, during this 2020 and all the stuff craziness going on, there were times they couldn't find meat at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, they, they were like, Hey, you know, like their wife and, and my wife are friends are like, Hey, you know, like we, oh, we could only get a pound of meat at the grocery store today. Uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm like, like, I didn't know that you couldn't find me at the store. Cause I have a freezer full <laughs> of, of all kinds of wild critters. You know I mean? Yesterday I felt like there was a bag and I was like, this wasn't labeled. I'm not sure what it is. We'll stick in the crock pot and see. You know, I was like, it, it was turkey. It was a wild turkey breast. And I was like, well, I thought it might be, but, you know, I was like, we'll see. It was delicious. But, you know, and I was like, hey, I was like, oh, okay. I was like, well, let's take them some, here's, here's a deer roast. They can throw it in the crock pot, throw some stuff on there. They can cook it very similar to they would a normal roast. And it's introducing them to it. And, and, and now, like, some of those folks are like, hey, can I go hunting with you? And, and they're not what you would call a typical hunting um, yeah. target they they you know if if we look at their beliefs next to my beliefs we're going to be on opposing sides of most everything that we believe and think <laughs> <Come to California. laughs> exactly exactly you know and so i mean and, and that's the way that but but you're going to have people coming through your classes in california or there's people that i'm meeting in downtown nashville that yeah that you know we we can we can have a great civil conversation and it's interesting that now they are hey i want to go can you teach me to deer hunt and so we're you know we're we're teaching them a little bit about hey you know you got to do you got to go through the safety course and you've got to do this and how to do it and how to do it right and mm -hmm. and i think that that's key but you know in that like another great way is by the food and mm -hmm. I definitely want to dive into a little bit about how, 
how you kind of got into the outdoor, the wild game cooking and, and, and how that's, how that's been a part of what you're doing and how you're helping other people and teaching other people through that method and you sharing it with other people and those people are sharing it. And it's, it's an amazing concept. It's an amazing way of doing things. And I just love to hear from, from your take, how it kind of started and, and how it's grown. So, and, and if we're speaking specifically to the flip flop method, um, I mean, I, that's what you're the yeah. flip flop guy, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, I actually just finished writing a article for field ethos magazine for their first hard print edition. That's coming out soon. Um, about the history of the flip flop. And I've spent a lot of time diving into the flip flop and diving into the origin, um, and where it actually comes from. So, to the best of my knowledge, so my grandfather got out of World War II, and in 1948, uh, he joined California Fish and Wildlife. From there, you know, that kind of granted him access. He was the warden for, and I, I want to say, and I, I can't remember specifically, but I want to say he was the lieutenant warden for Marin County and Sonoma County at the time, which is the north end of the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, he lived in West Marin and it granted him access to all the deer clubs, all the hunting clubs, you know, all the ranches, everything like that uh, within the community, within the ranching community, which was comprised primarily of, you know, Portuguese and uh, Italians at the time. Um, so there was a sheep rancher um, in and wool, I mean, wool sheep in, uh, in West Marin and Nicasio, California. And this family, from what I understand, would do sheep legs. And they would do entire sheep legs. And that's kind of, from what I understand, uh, their method. Now, my grandfather went over there, experienced this, and was like, I'm going to do that with a deer leg. And from there, he would go to all the different hunting clubs and all the different ranchers and everybody out there. And he would share his version of this flip flop with a venison leg, with a deer leg, um, with all the other ranching and, and hunting folk of West Marin and Sonoma County. And, you know, in the late 1950s and 60s, 70s, 80s, it was an enormous, you know, almost viral thing within the community of hunters at the time. Everybody was doing it. You know, there's, and everybody kind of would put their own twist on it or, or however they wanted to do it. And it became so well known that if anybody took their, la their animals to the butcher, their carcasses to the butcher, they could say, hey, we want you to cut us a flip-flop. And the butcher would cut them up a flip-flop. The problem is today, if you go to a butcher and say, hey, can you cut me, you know, can you leave this leg whole nine, nine times, nine and a half times out of 10, they'll cut that bone off and you'll just have the, you'll just have the roast, you'll just have the ham. And uh, anybody who's tried to do a flip flop that way knows that it's excruciatingly painful to try and <laughs> figure that one out. Um, so my grandfather started doing it and I was talking to my mom about this the other day. Uh, the amazing part about her entire life growing up is as far back as she can remember, you know, my grandfather had built his backyard to accommodate doing a flip flop. Right. And as did my father as well. So her whole life growing up, it was, you know, so all summer long flip flop parties, abalone feeds, you know, striped bass, sturgeon, halibut, salmon, you name it. If you could get it in the Bay Area, you know, that was kind of the, the way about living life. So fast forward 30 years and, and I'm just a kid and I'm running around doing my thing. My, my parents and all their friends, would do the same thing. They'd all get together for flip-flop barbecues and wild game feeds and 
you know, fish feeds and everything like that. And that was kind of my introduction into wild game cooking. And I'm very fortunate that I come from, you know, a long line of hunting and, and a long line of wild game cooking. So it kind of just replicated and, and, you know, like when I bought my house, excuse me, one of the biggest things about my house was can I accommodate doing flip-flop barbecues in my backyard, right? Like that was part of the exact reason why I bought my house because the yard was perfect for doing venison legs and, you know, having those experiences and those parties at the house. Yeah. So as we do the flip-flop and, and I'm, I'm looking out, I'll be honest for myself right here. What kind of, what kind of grill, set up do we need for you know to, to really have a good flip-flop setup yeah so when it comes to doing a flip-flop now i've done i'll say hundreds of legs you know in the 10 years that i've been doing i've done hundreds of legs and it's i've done it over campfires i've done it with wood i've done it you know with charcoal i've, I've done it all sorts of ways the best way that I've found to do it is you need immediate direct heat. And the, the best direct heat that I've found for doing it has always been charcoal. So my preference on doing a flip-flop is a charcoal grill. Um, you know, and, and that can be, you know, when you make it home or, or however. Uh, but you need that constant direct heat, you know, a thousand plus degrees when it's burning and uh i say that a lot and uh <laughs> so terrible and so you take your whole you take your whole hind quarter and you got your handle and i'll put it i'll i'll cut off all the aged meat and i'll you know use my rosemary mop and i'll brush it on the top right and I'll throw that face down on top of the charcoal. Now this is when the charcoal is, you know, glowing white with little flames coming out the top, right? The charcoal maybe be max three inches underneath that leg. And I'll throw it on the, I'll throw it on the grill. And I know that when I'm done marinating, you know, with the rosemary mop, when I'm done adding on the flip flop sauce, cause that's, you know, what we've been using for 70 plus years. <laughs> when I add the flip-flop sauce on, and then I do a little bit of salt and pepper dust right on the top, and I flip that leg, you know, it's all happening in under a minute, right? Because that's how fast it cooks. So you're eating from the time the meat hits the grill, you know, to, to meat in, in the person's mouth, right? <laughs> is is less than a minute you know and and what's funny is i mean i've cooked for top chefs you know people with tv shows all kinds of stuff and i've i've had them sitting there with their plate of sides cooked and ready to eat and i come out with a 15 pound leg and they look at me like how is this guy going to cook that meat in time for me to eat my sides and have my meat at the same time. They, they're like, this guy's crazy. And then I throw it on and I start cooking and they're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You know, cause you wouldn't expect it to cook that fast, right? Uh, so what you're looking for in that first cut or in, in every cut is extremely seared on the top and rare to raw underneath the cut, right? So you're cutting quarter inch thick steaks. I prefer to use a 14 inch brisket knife. And the reason why I use a 14 inch brisket slicer is when you're dealing with a, you know, a thousand plus degree heat, you kind of want to keep your hand out of that flame. Cause that's not, I burnt a lot of arm hair off my arms. That's for sure. You know, and, and uh, I've tried it with gloves It never, I've never found a glove that actually works. You know what I mean? Like every, I mean, they work, but like you lose functionality in the knife, you use functionality in handling the leg. Uh, hey, 
I completely understand. Like we have a circus company, we do fire breathing. Mm -hmm. And if we have a fire breathing performance, like I, every time I'm in the shower for like the next two weeks, it's just like, I wash my face and it's burnt hair smell <laughs> and you know, not, not appeasing, especially when you're trying to eat. So I, mean, I completely understand. Like it, it doesn't matter like what you wear, what you do, like you're going to have, some singe going on there. I mean, that's the yeah. purpose of having a hot fire to cook food. You're cooking yeah. meat. Don't cook your own own meat, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's the price, right? Yeah. It's worth <laughs> it, though. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the flip-flop is in, in my life in the 10 years that I've been doing it, uh, when the, I would say when the blade was handed to me from my father, um, you know, the, the experience, the camaraderie, the community, you know, and back to your point of what you were saying, the food, bringing everybody together. And you have 30 people around a barbecue that's everybody's excited. And some people are iffy and some people might be vegetarian and vegan. Excuse me. Um, I have watched vegetarians and vegans and people that don't like wild game fall in love with the process of cooking and being willing to eat and try it for their first time and falling in love with the flavor of the meat. Yeah. And, uh, and part of it is, you know, seeing what, what you're doing and being there to experience it. And even hearing a little bit about the story, you know, we've, we've experienced that here We vegetarians or vegans come over to the house and we're, you know, we're, we're having the mushrooms that, you know, we, the four, the kids help to forage and then we're having elk or deer. And we talk about how we've used every bit of it that we possibly can. And even though they may not always dive in, they're at least appreciative. And we're able to just kind of discuss a little bit about why we hunt and how we hunt. And yeah. it's not a, you're right. We're wrong kind of thing. It's, it's more of a, Hey, like we're doing this. We, we both have our own reasons for doing it. And I, I see you. I appreciate you. And if you would like to join in, you're welcome to, if not, no big deal. And, and like you said, just seeing that and seeing that process, I think is a big, big deal for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, cause everybody's like, you know, I, I've, I've seen like, if there was a, um, a movie star that Bear Grylls was taken out and he was even talking about like how much he likes meat, but he's like, I just like to think about it coming in a package from the grocery store. And so many people <laughs> feel that way, you know I mean? So I think that's where we are right now, but seeing the, the love and the care that you're taking for this meat and how you're doing it, I think is a big, big process that, that will help us open the doors to other people. Absolutely. I agree with that completely. I mean, I cooked for, um, a bunch of UC Berkeley, uh, I want to say they were on the board or, you know, they were, they were very high in the, in the in the Berkeley system. They don't get their hands dirty much, do they? No, they don't, <laughs> but they love a venison flip-flop, you know, and these are all people that are anti-hunting, you know, not really willing to try a wild game. And when I first presented the leg, 80% of them said they weren't going to eat that. And by the end of that leg and, and you've experienced it, you know, by the end of that leg, you know, how many ever flips later that is 25, 30 flips later, 100% of them had tried it and loved it, you know, and that's again, back to what you were saying. I mean, that's changing hearts and minds and that's bringing people back to a side of viewing hunting in a better, more appropriate light than what's been presented over the last 30 years in what I would call the destruction of the American hunter and traditional American hunting. Yeah. I mean, you know, was a, a little bit of sugar helps, helps the medicine go down kind of thing. Like you, I, I, you know, whether it's health and fitness or if it's exercise, if it's hunting, like if you take and you try to beat it, you know, I mean, we've seen this a lot in the spiritual realm, like people try to beat the Bible of somebody's head and you're like, dude, I have no interest in ever, yeah. Like hearing anything Bible again, but then you, but whenever you are the, 
you're the Bible that somebody reads is, is some people say like, you're the one out there and you're loving on people and you're caring for people. And you like, I don't care what your beliefs, your, your religion, your race. I don't care anything about that. I'm here to help you. And I want to love on you. And that's really what we're doing with the food. We're like, Hey, like, this is deer. I don't care if you like to hunt or not it, that I'm not judging you on that. Like I'm, I'm here. I have food and I would love <laughs> to get, I would love to give you some, most people are going to, not turn down a good steak. I mean, that, that's just, you know, very rarely is anybody going to be like, I don't want a steak. Thank you. You know? So, um, and I think that's one of the, like, where we're at right now and, and what you're doing is so great because you're helping other people. And, and I mean, you're in California, you're in the, I mean, we'd say the heart of an anti hunting yeah. society. And, yeah. and, and I think a lot of it is, um, I don't even know if it's anti-hunting, but it's just a not understanding hunting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we have to do is people, you have some people on far, far one side, you know, whether it's politics or religion or hunting, like you people on one side who are like die hard, I'm going to hunt and you're never going to, you know, take, you can take the gun from my dead hands. But on the other side, you have people who are like hunting is, the most evil thing you can ever do, but yep. then that's that small portion. And then on the other side, you have people like, yeah, I hunt and I enjoy it. And then you have people like, I'm okay with hunting, whatever. And then those people in the middle that are kind of up in the air. And I think that's where we can really make an impact. You know, we may never change that small fraction. That's, you know, like if you hunt, I'm going to hunt you comments that we see online, <laughs> you know, that, that are so ridiculous. But, but those other people that are like, Eh, I don't care if you hunt or not. I'm not going to, to all the way to like, I don't know anything about hunting. Those people are the ones who are really going to make an impact that can change. And it's that, you know, as they say, silent, silent majority or whatever, where there's those people are just kind of like, Hey, I don't care either way, whatever, you know? So I think that's where we're making an impact. And like you said, you're, you're seeing it firsthand and, and I'm, I'm pumped because uh, we've been d discussing what kind of grill are we going to get? Cause uh, you know, I had a small charcoal grill and, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of gas. I'll be honest. So I've been yeah. looking like what kind of charcoal grill am I going to get? You know, what kind of grill do I need to get? And I've been studying some of what you're doing. That's where you're like, I want to ask it. What kind of grill do I need to get so I can do this flip flop method in my backyard and just have people over to like, Hey, come enjoy this venison with me. I mean, if you're, if you're really looking for an all encompassing charcoal grill, that can get the job done on many levels and also be a fire pit at the end of the night. Um, I definitely recommend a birch barrel. That's what I use. I use the birch barrel a lot. Um, I love the company. The guys in it are great. They've been nothing but great to me. Uh, it's a new company. I want to say they're less than a year old. And one of my big fears in the last, you know, 10 years prior to me using this grill, any time that you have a hundred or 150 people around, there's always kids, right? And every charcoal grill that I've ever used gets so scalding hot on the side that like kids and scalding hot grills is definitely a fear for me, right? And like, especially as the person who's hosting, you know, the last thing I want is some kid to burn their shoulder off, you know, right. like sear their entire shoulder skin off or their hand or something like that, you know, and, and change their life forever. The birch barrel I've cooked on it for 10 hours straight. And that outside shell doesn't get, I mean, it'll get warm. Sometimes it'll get hot depending on the direct sunlight. Um, but it will never get hot to like, to the point where you can't put your hand on it for three or four or five seconds. You know what I mean? And uh, I've demonstrated that a lot to a lot of people. And not only that, I mean, the way that the, the vacuum system works inside that grill, I mean, it, it pulls air in and distributes heat unlike any heat that I've ever seen, which is perfect and optimal for exactly what I'm doing when I'm cooking, as well as you know, doing a low smoke on, you know, on a brisket or doing a smoke on some beef ribs for eight, 10, 12 hours. And they're coming out phenomenal, you know, and, and it's just, uh, I mean, I guess the best way to say is like, 
when I'm, when I'm smoking or cooking chicken or burgers or something like that, and I've got direct heat and that charcoal is really, you know, really ripping, I can lock the grill into the lid and I can pull the grill above the flame, right? Which allows for more cold air circulation. And I can really control the temperature and the heat of what I'm cooking. And it, and it really is, I mean, Roby really came up with a great product. You know, yeah. he, he smashed that out of the park. Yeah, I'm, I, I saw like you cooking on that. It was really intriguing to me. And I, I've got to dive into that for, for real and, and just learn more about it. But I mean, that, that's uh, having a, the good solid charcoal, you know, and today everybody's using gas and pellets and that sort of thing. And for me, I want like, I want it as natural as I can and not have to worry about, let me go plug it into the wall and to keep it hot. You know what I mean? I'm okay with like, this is charcoal. This is wood. This is good stuff. Uh, let's use that when we can, because you know, like you said, with that, you can use it anywhere. You don't have to plug it in and to keep it hot and keep it going. And that is, that is real critical for me. And, you know, and then you turn it, like you said, to turn to a fire pit whenever you're done cooking and everybody sits around and you can have, have s'mores or whatever you want. Like afterwards, oh, yeah. that, that is, that is really cool that it's that versatile. And so I'm, I'm going to have to dive into that and, and uh, see about, see about getting one getting one for us to, to enjoy because you know we with the little kids that's really important to me too is um even with a you know even with a gas grill you, you kind of worry about the kids sticking their you know getting cl too close and getting hot and you know or if it's just a normal fire pit and you know, you're always conscious of that but but when you're cooking and you said it's that hot you definitely don't want you know a kid kids 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 run wild you know they yeah, trip and fall and you don't want them bam one. yeah 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 you have to be yeah safety's number one because not that will, you know, I've, I've worked with burn patients and it's, you know, it is horrendous. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, you know, and it's one of those things that you just like a, a, a fear, no doubt um, that you want to avoid at all costs. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on the flip flop side, you, now you have your own uh, sauce yeah. and you have your own sauce that, that we can use. And yeah. so, I mean, I'm pretty pumped, but you, you, like you're branching out and you're doing a lot of cool things and everything that you're doing, it just comes back to the side of getting people involved in the outdoors and that I am appreciative of you for and everything that you're doing. And, yeah. uh, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, oh, man. And, and I, I, like I said, you know, just, I, I trust word of mouth more than I do a commercial somewhere. And that's, <laughs> that, and that's really how I heard about you is, is I've heard a couple of people talk about the flip flop method or the flip flop guy. And I was like, what? No, what? You know? And my first thought was like some dude wearing flip flops, you know? And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. And but, you I know, cause I, a lot. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. But yeah, then I, then I, then I saw it and I was like, Oh, okay. I got it. You know, that that's cool. And so I, I'm really, you know, I was like diving into that hearing word of mouth about how, good the meat is how great it is and that's really turned me on to everything you're doing but i would love for you just to take a moment to share uh about your podcast about the yeah. sauce about all the other things that you have going and yeah. how others can connect with you and learn more about you get get some sauce and start cooking the flip-flop yeah. method whenever they kill a deer this fall yeah absolutely um so a few years back, I started a podcast with a friend of mine. Um, he was actually the originator of the podcast. It's called Legion DIY. Uh, and really, the goal of that is, you know, just talking hunting and talking experience with other guys that hunt. Um, I did DIY on it because for me, everything that I've been doing um, has been a lot of just, I've been bulldozing myself for a lot of years, grinding for a lot of years, um, to get to the point where I'm at today. Uh, so the podcast is primarily California based, um, uh, really dives into a lot of California hunters. Uh, in California, we were lacking a lot of hunting representation and, uh, there's been a ton of other podcasts as well for California that have come out. Um, but my podcast is called Legion DIY. We have a great time on it. It's really fun. Uh, there's a lot of really good guests. And then 
transferring from that into the flip-flop guy. Um, you know, as I said, I've been doing the flip-flop. It's been in my family um, for 70 plus years. You know, my grandfather started doing it with deer legs, you know, back in the late 1950s and then in the, whatever, in the 1950s in California. Um, and I have a website. It's www.theflipflopguy.co.co. Um, it's, I just launched it a month, two months ago about now. So it's, it's still being built out. You can definitely go on there, order sauce. I'm doing sauce drops right now, once a month. Uh, usually right around the first of the month, I'll ship out all the orders that I get. If anybody has a broken bottle or a bottle that needs to be replaced because USPS is not kindly, I will always, you know, refill that bottle, send them a new bottle, whatever it is. Um, uh, there's also the Instagram page at the flip flop guy. You can find out a lot of information. You can see a lot of different things with the flip flop. Uh, the sauce was an entire development. It actually took me three years uh, working with a facility that can package it USDA approved. Um, you know, for them to get the recipe right. And what it ended up coming down to <clears throat> at the end of the day was they hand fill each bottle one at a time because the quality control for me, I'm, that's how anal I am about the quality control of the sauce and, and how perfect the recipe had to be in order for it to be right. And it wasn't until they started hand filling the bottles one at a time that really nailed and hammered down exactly what I was looking for with the recipe. Excuse me. And uh, yeah, the, so the sauce and then for me, you know, I, I do a lot of photography. I do a lot of hunting. Um, I'm very fortunate in the sense that I get to go out on all different kinds of hunts all over the United States, whether it be elk, deer, sheep hunting. You know, last year I was fortunate, I had the opportunity to go out to British Columbia on a stone sheep hunt for 15 days, which was an amazing experience. That video is actually on YouTube on, um, I think it's hunt the experience or the hunt experience. And it was Dallas Coda's um, sheep hunt absolutely great time um but yeah man i mean you know for the most part for me just running around I, I really love cooking for people i really love sharing the experience of the outdoors across the board whether it's through pictures through food you know through telling stories you know and that's kind of where i'm at with all of it you know and that's kind of the basis that i've covered you know is food stories and and photography and videography um, you know, earlier this year, I was afforded the opportunity, um, field ethos took me out and went and cooked a deer leg for Don Trump Jr. And it was his first time ever having a flip flop and to watch him fall in love with it, just as everybody else had fallen in love with it. And everybody else that was at that barbecue gunworks was out there. A lot of other companies who were out there um was amazing you know and and to think that i've had the ability through food to cook a meal for the president's son and you know his his friends is unreal you know and it's through wild game and through preparation of wild game um that allowed that to happen you know so it's the flip-flop is an experience man yeah it's an experience for sure it, yeah but it, it's it's more than that it's you have worked hard and you've you know and really you, you've you've faced demons and overcome things and all circled back to you know, now you're able to give back. And I, I think that, you know, when we do good things, 
when we do what, what we're supposed to be doing, when we do right, uh, you know, when you're living right, then things seem to just somehow, they just seem to work out for us. It's, it's one of those weird things in life, you know? Biblical. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, but yeah, man, I really appreciate, I really appreciate you coming on and it's been a really informative to me and, and, and I know everybody out there is, is, is I know we've opened a lot of doors. We've talked about, you know, mental health and, and even got into the cooking side, which is our physical side as well. But I, I really want to ask you one final question. Yeah. Which, ask me as many as you want. Yeah. Which, which is um, a, a dream hunt. So now you get to choose where you're going, what you're going after, what you're going to use to hunt, but most importantly, who's going with you and there's no rules there's no limitations and it's all your ultimate dream hunt if you can go anywhere after anything with anything but most importantly who's going with you the dream team of the hunt man that's a really that's a, <laughs> that's a really good question um so I'm going to go on two, two different routes with this. Uh, one of the biggest things for me with the flip-flop is that I've made a promise to myself that I will not take any money out of the company that I'm building behind the flip-flop sauce until I'm able to afford to take my dad on a moose and a grizzly bear hunt. Um, my dad's 70 years old and he's getting older. Um, and my dream is that, you know, my dad worked very hard. He swung a hammer his whole life, you know, and he built this amazing family and he built, you know, this amazing life for himself. And in that he missed a lot of opportunities of going out on all kinds of hunts that he wanted to go out on, you know, in the eighties and nineties and, and early two thousands, he got to do a lot of awesome hunts, but there was a lot of hunts that, he never had the opportunity to do. So for me, one of the biggest things is, is to be able to afford to take my dad out, you know, on his own hunts. Um, and if, if I can get him with a, with one of the bows, he was, he's, he's a stickler, right? He's Italian. So he would make all of his own traditional bows out, you know, from scratch, you know, and he's made five or six and this is going all the way back to the early eighties and he's killed plenty of bucks with them, but I'd really love to get him on a hunt where he could use one of his bows that he made and he could take a moose or take a bear or something like that. Um, so that being said, my dream hunt, <laughs> what would my dream hunt be for myself? Um, There's part of me that wants to do, you know, like a just an epic mule deer hunt, you know, and going for that 200 plus typical mule deer. Um, but I, I think if I was going to do a dream hunt, it would be, you know, British Columbia. It'd be a stone sheep hunt, you know. Um, I would, I would love to somehow convince Brendan Burns, uh, Don Jr., um, Jake Franklin, Jeff Rowley, you know, and, and, and maybe one or two other guys to come along, you know, Brady Lowe and a couple other guys to come along on that hunt. Um, I've spent time with all of those guys. and the amount of fun that we've all had together, whether it be in the field or behind a barbecue or, or any of it, you know, that's really what it's all about at the end of the day is, is being in the field with a really good team, you know, Mark Seacat, you know, Willie, um, being, being in the field with a really great team of guys, you could have, zero success. And when I say success, I mean, you know, no tags filled, but if you're in the field with a team that is absolute, you know, solid folks, 
and you're out there doing it and there's no success, it's still a great hunt. And the memories are still so great, you know, and, and I know uh, having spent, you know, quite amount of time with those guys that it would be the experience, even if none of us killed anything, would be 100% one of the best experiences of all of our lives. You know, and, and you can't, you can't put a dollar sign on that. You can't, you can't put, I, I mean, I wouldn't even, yeah. 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 That would yeah. be the dream hunt. Yeah. And, and I think that, that, that right there speaks a lot because it's not too often. We think success is what we drag home, whether it's, you know, money or fame or, or a deer. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really not, it's time and it's the impact that we make and how we get better and help others get better, which yeah. you're doing through yeah, all, everything that you're doing. And for that, I appreciate you. Yeah, man. And, and those, and I'm sure you've experienced it in the field, those moments, you know, it's been a long grueling days hunt, you know, or weeks hunt, but you're still in the field and you're laughing until you cry. And you're having a great time with everybody that's there for the experience and they're along for the ride. Yeah. And that's irreplaceable. There's no store that in the memory bank and cherish it forever kind of deal, you know? Yeah. And it's great to be out there and do things and bring home a big trophy. But if you're sitting around the table all alone, with no story to laugh about and tell about that the food doesn't taste as good. Yeah. You know, and I'll go on a tangent here. <clears throat> Me and my dad and another buddy just came back from a hunt in Utah. And on this Utah hunt, um, it was my fourth year in a row drawing a Utah tag. And it was a completely unsuccessful hunt in the fact of killing an animal and filling our tags. Um, but it's in the top five best hunts of my life, you know, and, and my dad got to see bucks and have bucks in the scope and decide that it wasn't a mature enough animal and he didn't want to shoot it. Um, I had, you know, nine or 10 opportunities to shoot plenty of different bucks and pass on those bucks, you know, and, and we'd really come up with, these are the target size, you know, mature four year old or, four year old or older buck and and we didn't find that and we passed opportunities and we all had a great time together you know and that's it was you know I, i'll take that tag home all day long it was a great hunt yeah i think there's a great quote somebody said that was a lot smarter than me and it was <laughs> the price of anything that doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to be smarter than me. <laughs> but they said the price of anything is the amount of life you're willing to exchange for it. And, you know, and I think that's really what it is. You know, you're, maybe people may think, oh man, you, you know, you took a week off of work and you're out there and you're spent all this money, but it's not that it's, you know, that experience is worth so much more than any, dollar amount it's that amount of life that you've exchanged for it and we can you know i always think about this we can buy a bunch of junk we can buy have all the new cool fancy gadgets but that costs money but you could just take that same amount of money and you could spend a week or two in the woods with those people that mean the most to you and having an adventure and that money spent that way is going to be worth more mm -hmm. than you know some cool fancy phone or gadget that you can yeah. uh, you know have so um you know it's more of a memories are much worth more than things in my you know because so i like to collect Material. collect moments not things and um but man hey i i am super super humbled i am gracious and grateful because of all that you're doing and, and you're making the world a better place for, <laughs> for, for me, for my kids, for, for everybody. And I mean, and just by 
being you and being open and honest and the way that you're helping other people and you're pouring into them. And, you know, is there any final notes, any final encouragement that you would like to send out there to everyone as we, before we sign off? Yeah, man. I mean, the biggest thing that I would say is that we're our worst critics. Um, you know, that, you know, we talked about the mental struggles. Um, you know, and nothing is ever going to be put on our plate that's too much. Nothing is ever going to be put on our plate that we can't handle. There's a plan behind everything. No matter how dark it is, no matter how dark it gets, the reason I believe the reason why we go through these hard times and we go through these struggles is to make ourselves better and be able to help the next person that might be going through the same struggles. Because if we're all going through dark times and dark struggles and, and hardships, and we're not sharing these with other people, and we're not sharing our experiences with other people, and how we came out of them, no one's going to be able to find their way out of them, you know, and, and to everybody that's come before me on their hardships and their struggles and their turmoils in life and helped me through my dark days and walked me through them by giving me their direct life experience. You know, I wouldn't be able to be here today to share my experience you know, of how to overcome the stuff that I've overcome, you know, and, and, you know, and that's, and it goes back again to, you know, we're all, we're all in this together, man. It doesn't matter left, right, center, you know, any of it at the end of the day, we're all in this together. And, and if we're all not here to help each other and love on each other and, and help each other thrive, then, then what are we doing? You know, what are as a society, as humans, then, then what are we doing? What's the point, you know? And, and to me, the point is to, to help everybody that we can, you know? I, I agree. And if anybody out there is struggling, you have obstacles, you're, you're falling down. One thing I always tell when I get a chance to speak, especially youth groups is you will fall down, but it's what you do next. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you fall down and you stay down, then you, you lose. But if yeah. you get back up, whatever that obstacle that just tripped you up, it, it's like, you know, they say uh, when a good man gets up the, every morning, the devil's like, oh, crap, he's awake. You know, like mm -hmm. and those obstacles are going to come up and they're going to be there. If we share how we overcame, if like you have, if we put that out there, other people are going to reach out to us. And I want to encourage anybody that's struggling, whatever you're struggling with, you know, if it's. If, if it's physical, if it's mental, if it's relationships, whatever, uh, feel free, like reach out to somebody, whether it's, if it's, if it's me, if it, if it's Andy, if it's, but reach out to somebody and just say, Hey, can we talk? And, yeah. and can we, can we please just, can we spend a little, let's go, let's go for a walk in the woods and yeah. chat and what, you know, let, let, let nature just reorganize and, and straighten us out for a little bit. And, but just never be afraid to uh, set your pride aside to go and reach out and say, Hey, can I have a little bit of help? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Man, Andy, thank you so much. I, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I want to encourage everybody go kill a deer, try the flip flop method <laughs> and it, because, uh, it, you're going to enjoy, but if it, and, and for further resource, we'll, we'll put a link down below of some, some examples of using the flip flop method. And, and, uh, whenever I get a good grill, I'll put my own video up, but, uh, go, go get some sauce, try the flip flop method. And as always stay humble, be hungry and get healthy. Hang on the sunshine.